The boycott, truly, it's one of the best forms of struggle for a group such as ours, and it gives the best kind of involvement to people who are willing and who want to help the disadvantaged and the poor. And as a non-violent weapon, it's, I think, uh, very difficult to find another one that would uh, be superior to it. Dear Mr. Barr, I am sad to hear about your accusations in the press that our union movement and Table Great Boycott have been successful because we have used violence and terror tactics. If what you say is true, I have been a failure and should withdraw from the struggle, but you are left with the awesome moral responsibility before God and man to come forward with whatever information you have so that corrective action can begin at once. If for any reason you fail to come forth to substantiate your charges, then you must be held responsible for committing violence against us, albeit violence of the tongue. I am convinced that you as a human being did not mean what you said, but rather acted hastily under pressure from the public relations firm that has been hired to try to counteract the tremendous moral force of our movement. How many times we ourselves have felt the need to lash out in anger and bitterness. Well, Mark, thank you for having us here today. Well, welcome to the Cesar E. Chavez National Monument, the 398th unit of the National Park Service, where Cesar lived and labored his last quarter century. It's a beautiful location. All the mountains, it feels nice. So, Mark, I know that Mr. Chavez, Cesar Chavez, he had a lot of influence from Gandhi. He was a believer of nonviolence. And that even in his letter from Delano, he mentions Gandhi several times, I believe. What's the history with surrounding Cesar Chavez's influence from him? Well, what do you think was going on in 1969 in Delano? Well, as I've learned from some of my professors, that was the fourth year of the grape strike, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It was, and uh, there was no sign that the growers were going to give up anytime soon. They still refused to recognize the union or to bargain for union contracts. The letter from Delano really did reflect a lot of the lessons Caesar had learned from reading Gandhi beginning in around 1951, when he was only about 24 years old. He started reading books about Gandhi, and then he read all of Gandhi's writings. Did Chavez meditate? You know, the hill right behind us, Caesar was a devout Catholic. He was also a student of Eastern religion. Mm. He practiced uh, yoga and meditation. Early in the morning before dawn, he would climb that hill near his house and he would watch the sunrise and say his prayers and do his yoga. So Mark, this place must have really helped Cesar Chavez ground himself since he didn't take any vacations, but yet he would practice meditation every day. Well, he named this place Nuestra Señora Reina de la Paz, Our Lady Queen of Peace. And for him, it was a sanctuary. It was a place where he could recharge batteries and plan for the next campaign. In the 31 years he led the United Farm Workers, he never took a vacation. And he, he would work uh, 14, 15, 16 hours a day. You know, man was uh, singularly driven and determined. Today, on Good Friday, 1969, we remember the life and the sacrifice of Martin Luther King Jr., who gave himself totally to the nonviolent struggle for peace and justice. In his letter from Birmingham Jail, Dr. King describes better than I could our hopes for the strike and boycott. Injustice must be exposed with all the tensions its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. For our part, I admit that we have seized upon every tactic and strategy consistent with the morality of our cause to expose that injustice and thus to heighten the sensitivity of the American conscience so that farm workers will have without bloodshed their own union and the dignity of bargaining with their agribusiness employers. By lying about the nature of our movement, Mr. Barr, you are working against nonviolent social change unwittingly perhaps, you may unleash that other force which our union by discipline and deed 
censure in education has sought to avoid, that panacea shortcut, that senseless violence which honors no color, class, or neighborhood. So Mark, a letter from Delano has its comparisons to MLK's A Letter from Birmingham Jail, correct? Very much. Uh, Caesar was heavily influenced by Dr. King, read the letter from the Birmingham jail, uh, was very moved by it. So Mr. Barr accuses Chavez of using violence during his movement. However, we know that Cesar Chavez practiced nonviolence. So when and how did Cesar Chavez learn about nonviolence in people like Gandhi? Caesar first discovered Gandhi through his parish priest, Father Donald McDonald, in the East San Jose barrio of South Puedes around 1951. Uh, he read everything he could find about Gandhi, books about him and books by him. Caesar came to see these lessons from Gandhi, especially nonviolence and the boycott, which were closely linked by following Dr. King's career, beginning with the 1955-56 Montgomery bus boycott that Rosa Parks began. Caesar would say that when he read newspaper accounts of the bus boycott, that the words would fly off the pages to him. So Caesar Chavez, United Farm Workers Movement, one of the most famous tactics they used was the boycott. What sort of precedence was there for this in the American labor movement at the time? Well, unions had never really used a large-scale boycott before. And there were some national labor leaders that scoffed at the idea of boycotting because they never tried it. And Mark, what was uh, America like in the late 1960s? You have to remember the times. Uh, Dr. King and Robert Kennedy had been assassinated. And, uh, the Vietnam War was raging. Thousands and thousands were protesting the war in the streets. And many of the ghettos were ablaze with civil disorder. Caesar believed that the American people were yearning for an alternative to violence. And he thought if the poorest of the poor were seen struggling non-violently against great odds, that people would respond. And they did. Hundreds of farm workers and their families went out across America to organize a boycott. And tens of thousands picketed supermarkets. Millions of consumers boycotted grapes. Caesar and the movement created the broadest coalition in the history of the American Civil Rights Movement. Students and union families and faith activists, and environmental activists, and all manner of consumers, people from all walks of life, were united in doing one simple deed, not buying grapes. You must understand, I must make you understand, that our membership and the hopes and aspirations of the hundreds of thousands of the poor and dispossessed that have been raised on our account are, above all, human beings. No better and no worse than any other cross-section of human society. We are not saints because we are poor, but by the same measure, neither are we immoral. We are men and women who have suffered and endured much, and not only because of our abject poverty, but because we have been kept poor. The colors of our skins, the languages of our culture and native origins, the lack of formal education, the exclusion from the democratic process, the numbers of our men slain in recent wars. All these burdens, generation after generation, have sought to demoralize us, to break our human spirit. But God knows that we are not beasts of burden agricultural implements, or rented slaves. We are men. And mark this well, Mr. Barr. We are men locked in a death struggle against man's inhumanity to man in the industry that you represent. And this struggle itself gives meaning to our life and ennobles our dying. So Mark, how did Caesar's experiences with abuse define and shape his aspirations for his movement and his people? Caesar was about giving people opportunities who looked like him that no one would have given Caesar Chavez when he was a young migrant worker with an eighth grade education. If he spotted young people with talent, especially if they came from a 
farm worker or working class family, he would convince them they could be something more, an accountant, uh, administrator, a negotiator, and he would push them really hard to do it. Certainly, Caesar wanted results in the office, uh, but he saw the greater benefit of helping people fulfill dreams, dreams many of them didn't even know they had. And he gave thousands more opportunities to learn the skills and the, have the experience that led them to lives of professional success and to careers and activism and social political involvement. Well, that really speaks to the faith that Cesar Chavez, he had in the people, right? Cesar used to say that his job as an organizer was to help ordinary people do extraordinary things. He would convince everyone in the movement that the jobs that they had were vitally important. Maybe that's why uh, he succeeded, where others who had a lot better educations and much more money tried and failed for a hundred years to organize farm workers. And in the process, he inspired millions and millions of, of people to social political activism, most of whom never set foot on a farm. As your industry has experienced, our strikers here in Delano and those who represent us throughout the world are well trained for this struggle. They have been under the gun. They have been kicked and beaten and herded by dogs. They have been cursed and ridiculed. They have been stripped and chained and jailed. They have been sprayed with the poisons used in the vineyards. But they have been taught not to lie down and die, nor to flee in shame, but to resist with every ounce of human endurance and spirit. To resist not with retaliation in kind, but to overcome with love and compassion, with ingenuity and creativity, with hard work and longer hours, with stamina and patient tenacity, with truth and public appeal, with friends and allies, with nobility and discipline, with politics and law, and with prayer and fasting. They were not trained in a month or even a year. After all, this new harvest season will mark our fourth full year on strike. And even now, we continue to plan and prepare for the years to come. Time accomplishes for the poor what money does for the rich. So people often think that nonviolence is weak, but Caesar didn't think that. Why not? It's true that nonviolence is difficult to justify in theory, but it can be most powerful in practice. Caesar learned about the strategic value of nonviolence from Gandhi. In Caesar's library, it was carefully preserved, uh, a whole shelf of books is the complete writings of Mahatma Gandhi. Caesar read them all in dog-eared paperback volumes, including accounts of the salt boycott in 1930 during the fight for Indian independence and other boycotts against the British. But Caesar believed that nonviolence was more powerful than violence. It allowed you to control the fight. So you weren't constantly reacting to the attacks from your opposition. It also demanded that you outthink and outwork your opposition. You had to be smarter, more determined, more committed to the cause over time. But if nonviolence was only a strategy, and if it didn't work, then you could resort to violence. So Caesar believed that you had to balance the understanding of nonviolence with a commitment to its moral imperative. Caesar was a devout Catholic. Uh, he practiced Eastern religion, including Zen Buddhism, and he believed that uh, human life is a very special thing. It's a gift from God, and no one has a right to take it for any reason or for any cause, no matter how just it might be. So how did the boycott fit in with the nonviolence? The boycott allowed the farm workers to switch the scene of battle from the fields and vineyards where the odds were stacked heavily against them to the cities where the farm workers had a chance. And Gandhi wrote that the boycott was the most nearly perfect instrument for nonviolent change because it allowed masses of people to participate directly in the cause. Finally, uh, Caesar borrowed something else from Gandhi. A hallmark of uh, Gandhi's principles was striving for Hindu-Muslim unity during the fight 
for Indian independence. And Caesar applied that to the Delano grape strike. Caesar Chavez, Larry Leong, the other Latino Filipino leaders insisted that the Latino and Filipino grape strikers be on the same picket lines and use the same union hall and eat at the same strike kitchen. And it was that solidarity between the races that was a key factor in the success of the five year long Delano grape strike and in establishing the United Farm Workers as the first enduring farm worker union in American history. Part of that diversity is reflected here at Martyr's Rock, which is a tribute to the three great faiths of the five UFW martyrs. You'll see the Jewish Star of David. The first martyr was a young Jewish woman, Nan Freeman, who was killed on a picket line in Florida in 1972. The following year, in 1973, the second martyr was Naji Daifala, a young immigrant from Yemen who was killed during the 73 grape strike. And then a few days later, the third martyr was Juan de la Cruz, who was a Latino Catholic. And then the two other martyrs, Rufino Contreras and Rene Lopez, were also male Latino Catholics. So the farm worker movement was really reflective of the diversity that farm labor uh, was back in the 60s and 70s. And also the broad coalition of supporters of farm workers attracted, one of whom was Nan Freeman. This is not to pretend that we have everywhere been successful enough or that we have not made mistakes. And while we do not belittle or underestimate our adversaries, for they are the rich and the powerful and they possess the land, we are not afraid nor do we cringe from the confrontation. We welcome it. We have planned for it. We know that our cause is just that history is a story of social revolution and that the poor shall inherit the land. So the farm worker movement began in Delano, right? That's true. Welcome to the 40 Acres, which was the first permanent home of the movement, starting around 1969 uh, during the Delano grape strike. We're here at the Agbani village, which was the first retirement home for elderly and displaced Filipino farm workers who didn't have any other place to live and they lived out their lives here in comfort and security. So since nonviolence and perseverance comes hand in hand, how did that play out for Cesar Chavez and the farm worker movement? You have to remember in the 60s when the movement began, all the odds were arrayed against farm workers. The growers controlled the courts and the cops and all the legal, economic, social, political institutions in rural California. For a hundred years, all farm worker strikes and unions had been brutally crushed. And it was no different here in Delano when, when the Delano grape strike began in 1965. You know, in many ways, we face equally hostile times. I mean, there's the anti-immigrant bias, there's the attacks on dreamers and everybody's rights that were long and hard fought. Mark, if Cesar Chavez was alive today, what would he be working on? Well, people either don't know or they forget that in the 31 years that Caesar led the farm worker movement, he probably suffered more defeats and victories. After each defeat, he would pick himself up off the ground, dust himself off, and rejoin the nonviolent struggle. Uh, you know, he used to say that our work isn't like a baseball game. You know, you have nine innings and whatever team has the most runs at the end wins and the other team loses. And it's not like a political contest where, you know, one candidate gets more votes on election day and all the other candidates lose. He said, in our work in La Calza, the only time you lose is when you stop fighting. And so I think the lesson was clear, you know, that victory will be ours if we persist, if we resist, and if we refuse to give up. Persistence was key. Mm -hmm. That's right. Once again, I appeal to you as the representative of your industry and as a man. I ask you to recognize and bargain with our union before the economic pressure of the boycott and strike takes an irrevocable toll. But if not, I ask you to at least sit down with us to discuss the safeguards necessary to keep our historical struggle free of violence. 
I make this appeal because, as one of the leaders of our nonviolent movement, I know and accept my responsibility for preventing, if possible, the destruction of human life and property. For these reasons, and knowing of Gandhi's admonition that fasting is the last resort in place of the sword, during a most critical time in our movement last February 1968, I undertook a 25-day fast. I repeat to you the principle enunciated to the membership at the start of the fast. If to build our union required the deliberate taking of life, either the life of a grower or his child, or the life of a farm worker or his child, then I choose not to see the union built. So Gandhi speaks about facts and the power that it holds, and I was wondering why Caesar's 1968 fast was so powerful. Well, that fast took place here. Uh, this is the Tomasa Zapata co-op service station. It's where migrant workers could come for cheap gas and a place to fix their cars, but its first use was when Caesar fasted. He lost 35 pounds in 25 days here. Uh, doctors warned him that if he didn't stop fasting, he could cause permanent damage to his organs or maybe even die. Uh, he refused to speak with any reporters during his fast, but he did meet with many, many farm workers one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. If you could imagine, hundreds of people were camped out here overnight so they could be close to him. Daily mass was held with Caesar and hundreds of people, first inside this storeroom and then it got too big they went outside. And so what were people thinking during this time? People would see Caesar fasting and willing to sacrifice his life and so they would ask themselves and each other what more can I do to help the cause? Um, remember the great boycott had already begun but it really took off after national news coverage of the fast that was taking place here. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King sent Caesar a message expressing admiration and solidarity. Uh, Senator Robert Kennedy came here on the last day of the fast to visit with Caesar and then accompany him to a mass at Memorial Park in Delano. Senator Kennedy said that he had come to Delano out of respect for one of the heroic figures of our time. Caesar was too weak to speak, but a statement was read for him, and in part he said, it is my deepest belief that only by giving our lives do we find life. I am convinced that the truest act of courage, the strongest act of manliness, is to sacrifice ourselves for others in a totally nonviolent struggle for justice. He said, to be a man is to suffer for others. God help us to be men. Mr. Barr, let me be painfully honest with you. You must understand these things. We advocate militant nonviolence as our means for social revolution and to achieve justice for our people. But we are not blind or deaf to the desperate and moody winds of human frustration, impatience, and rage that blow among us. Gandhi himself admitted that if his only choice were cowardice or violence, he would choose violence. Men are not angels and the time and tide wait for no man. Precisely because of these powerful human emotions, we have tried to involve masses of people in their own struggle. Participation and self-determination remain the best experience of freedom, and free men instinctively prefer democratic change and even protect the rights guaranteed to seek it. Only the enslaved in despair have need of violent overthrow. Mark, what prompted the fast in 1968? Well, Caesar was fasting in a tiny room in this co-op service station behind us. Uh, but in 1968, this was the hungry winter of that year. You know, the Thule fog blankets the valley. And for farm workers, there's very little work in the winter time. It was two and a half years into the strike. There was no sign that the growers were going to give in anytime soon. Some of the young male strikers uh, were becoming impatient, and there was talk about retaliating in kind against the abuse and violence that was being visited on them on the picket line. So how did Caesar respond to some of the strikers talking about wanting to resort to violence? 
Some of the strikers quit, some of the staff quit out of disagreement with Caesar over nonviolence. But most people's hearts were moved by the fast. All the talk of violence ceased and Caesar won the argument. This letter does not express all that is in my heart, Mr. Barr. But if it says nothing else, it says that we do not hate you or rejoice to see your industry destroyed. We hate the agribusiness system that seeks to keep us enslaved. And we shall overcome and change it not by retaliation or bloodshed, but by a determined, nonviolent struggle carried on by those masses of farm workers who intend to be free and human. So it's interesting how Gandhi influenced Chavez, but how did Chavez influence his people? And what does that mean for us today? Well, Emily, so much about Gandhi was about his faith and spirituality. It was the same thing with Caesar. Caesar didn't talk much about his achievements, but he was insightful in one speech he delivered to the Commonwealth Club of California in San Francisco in 1984. And in that speech, he tapped his own faith when he said, someday we shall realize the fulfillment of that passage from the Gospel of Matthew in the, in the New Testament, that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Uh, Caesar came later in life to understand that his work had gone far beyond farm workers, that it had touched millions of Latinos and people from all walks of life who never worked on a farm. That insight's reflected in another part of that speech to the Commonwealth Club, when Caesar said, once social change begins, it cannot be reversed. You cannot uneducate the person who has learned to read. You cannot humiliate the person who feels pride. You cannot oppress the people who are not afraid anymore. Regardless of what the future holds for farm workers, our accomplishments cannot be undone. La causa, our cause, doesn't have to be experienced twice. The day will come when the politicians will do the right thing for our people out of political necessity and not out of charity or idealism. And on that day, our nation shall fulfill its creed and that fulfillment shall enrich us all. Thank you very much.